uh, pitch inspections. Uh, we'll give everybody a shout. If somebody gives us a thumbs up, please, when we get the match on, and we'll make a little announcement. Uh, we had a, a little late inspection here today, but uh, we managed to get Pete across from Leeds. Uh, and well done to Joe, by the way. We've got the BAFTA, oh, BAFTA nominated filmmaker filming our uh, talk today. Well done, Joe. <laughs> if you've not seen it, a bunch of amateurs, it's on BBC4 iPlay, it's well worth watching. Um, they didn't get the BAFTA, by the way. Anyway, it's lovely to uh, bring on Pete Watson from Leeds University, following on from Margaret's fabulous talk about uh, Colombian football. I managed to get a, 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 an email from Pete. He was passed on to us by Chris Stride, who was here last week, of course. And we thought, well, why not? Let's, let's continue this journey to uh, world football. So Pete's going to give us a little talk about the supporters' baraculture. So with no further ado, I'll pass you on to Pete. Probably going to be a, a kind of a, a crowd towards the door now, unfortunately. That's a shame. Um, firstly, thanks very much for having me along. Cheers very much to Dave for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be in, in here as well. Lovely club. Um, this is actually, I think, like the first time I've been in or near Bradford since I was about, since I was about eight or seven and was in Airedale Hostel with pneumonia, so it's a slightly happier return to the, the place. So, yeah, um, as David said, uh, my work basically is. Oh, sorry. I think so. Is that everyone hear me okay? Yeah, everyone hear me okay? Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, so my work is, is kind of about Colombian history more generally. Um, I've got a book out that's about the Santos period and how football is used for peace. Uh, but I'm going to talk really about the badass and the, what happens in the fan culture and kind of dispel a few myths, talk about how it works, what kind of culture goes on and how that's contributed in lots of ways to trying to reduce the stigma of what goes on in Colombia that I think everyone's aware of. So yeah, we're going to talk, start with where, where the Barra culture history emerges from, what kind of time period we're talking about. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the characteristics, some of the traditions, some of the practices, the way it's, you know, what happens in the stadium itself. Unfortunately, the videos are embedded, I don't think, in a work, but at least you'll get a little bit of an idea of what they do and how it works. We're going to talk as well about some of the things that go on outside the stadium, because I think that's just as important to know about. And then, yeah, we're going to talk about this phenomenon called barismo social, kind of social fan culture and what that's doing in Colombia's urban centres. Um, and lots of pictures of kind of violence going on as well. Um, so, the first thing I guess is to talk about what the Barras really are. Now you've got this problem of Barras is immediately associated with hooliganism. The worst excesses, you know, the violence, the stabbings, the shootings that go on. Barras are really what you call an organised fan group, an organised fan association. The violent aspect is when you tag on that bravas bit. So the baras bravas are the ones who will be involved with violence, with the fights, with these kind of stadium violence that does go on. The problem is, of course, and again, the same thing with the hooligan culture you have here, is that as soon as anything happens, everyone is a hooligan. Same thing in Colombia or Argentina or wherever else. As soon as there's some kind of violence, every single person is a member of a bara brava, which is not the case. Um, in Colombia, they tend to be called baras populares, these kind of so the popular of the people, fan clubs, or Barras Organizadas, because there's a high level of organisation involved that we're going to see. You know, it's a very intricate, very structured uh, system that all the, or a lot of the Barras really do have. Um, the other thing that's really important to talk about is that this is not a homogenous thing. You know, every single Barra has a very clear identity. They all have their own structures. They all have their ways of doing things. Uh, they have their ways of, of kind of uh, managing, some are more democratic than others. Um, but what we can say generally in the studies that have been done is that most of them, the majority of the members of these Barras, whether in Bogota or Cali or Medellin or any other cities, tend to be kind of 15 to 30 year olds. So one of the problems that you have with Barras is that they tend to be accommodating a lot of the people who are at the roots of a, or suffering from a lot of Colombia's urban problems or rural problems and the violences that have gone on in Colombia. So the Barras tend to be like a grouping point for disaffected youth that have been involved in some ways with gang violence, with displacement from the countryside because of what's going on there. So that's kind of part of the social problem. And a lot of the people that are coming into these Barras are trying to find some sense of a community where they can actually be part of a more structured society, because a lot of these people are from broken homes. A lot of the kind of urban um, kind of kids that are part of these badass come from that kind of background. Um, so when does it start? Um, you know, when uh, I think the talk you've had about El Dorado, you'd have none of this kind of fan culture at all. The actual 
professionalization of the league happens, as you've heard, in the kind of late 1940s. But the league doesn't really strengthen really until the 70s and 80s. That's when the fan culture really starts to organize. Um, the actual badass as we know them now, in the way that they become structured, they become organized, they, they create you know, a kind of demo a democracy or a, a kind of autocracy within them, really starts in the 1990s. And I'm going to show you a slide when all the different badass were formed, which will, which will show you that. And what it really is, it's very much a response to the way that Bada culture was in Argentina. They looked to Argentina as the main example. And this emerges from the fact that you start getting the televised football of South America, starts being seen across you know, the different you know, other countries as well. But you also get the Copa Libertadores teams. There were, the Bada started organizing and started traveling across the continent and the Colombian teams, the Peruvian teams, and the fans that are there start seeing you know, what the Boca Juniors or the River Plate or the various Uruguayan teams are doing and how their fans are doing the same. And there's, so there's this kind of reciprocal, why don't we do this? This should be something that our club has. We need to show the same kind of level of aguante, which I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, as those particular clubs do. So that's where it emerges from. It's quite a late phenomenon, you know. To some extent, some of the practices are copied from the European kind of ultras as well. But there is very much a kind of Argentinian influence. You know, all the people that have studied this, particularly across Colombia, always talk about this Argentinian influence. And indeed, the fans that have talked about it, the Bada leaders, often talk about the same things as well. We saw Boca Juniors when they played. They did this. We wanted to do the same. Um, what it also symbolizes is, again, it's, it's a kind of a moment when uh, the 1990s in Colombia, if you cast your minds back, uh, this is when I lived there in Colombia, actually, from 1989 to 1992, you have Pablo Escobar, you have, the, you have the drug cartel fights, you also have the FARC, the kind of guerrilla organization, the countryside, and you have paramilitaries. This kind of affects the urban environments as well. It's not just a rural phenomenon. So people are being dragged into potential conflict zones. And you have a kind of very, uh, kind of a sense of grouping together in gangs for self-protection, but also to kind of have an identity uh, and it's kind of an easier way to be involved, maybe to make money through sicarios or through, you know, easy drug money because there are a lot of these urban problems going on. So these kind of kids are there at this time and there is just another form of the social organisation that a lot of the people were going to criminal gangs or getting tied into cartels. Some of them were doing the same thing but joining also the football badass as well. So this is the kind of urban phenomenon that's going on the time and how football is kind of part of it. Um, what also happens is this is the time that Colombian football is getting stronger as well. Um, 1990 was the first time since 62 that Colombia qualified for the World Cup, the Valderrama, Aguita, Andres Escobar generation. Obviously, 94 has further success. And that success is translated into more people going to the domestic games because suddenly it seems it's worth going to. There are players that are exciting, that are worth seeing, that are doing well. And so it becomes something that's worth, oh God, that's worth um, being a fan of. Um, so here are the various fan organisations. These are the main ones. Um, the, the kind of top three are all in Bogota. We have the, the Blue Rain and we have the, the Blue Commandos, the Commandos Azules, um, the Guardia Albiroja Azul, uh, Sur, the kind of the white red guardians of the south. Um, that was a group I actually did a little bit of field work with um, about the Barismo Social. Again, another Bogota uh, based thing. Then you've got the, the kind of Medellin ones, Northern Resistance, you have those over to the south, and we go on and go for, I mean, again, a lot of these have kind of quite aggressive names. The standout one is the Caldas uh, team, the Northern Holocaust, uh, not possibly the most uh, public aware kind of friendly name. Um, they actually lost support from international organizations because they were running one of these Barismo Social projects that was kind of community work. But because they were called the Northern Holocaust, the groups that from Europe refused to fund them because of that. So, but they haven't changed. Um, and then we have, you know, the Band of the Crows and so on and so forth, the, the, the Southern Wolf. So these are all the main ones. These are some of the biggest established badass. And again, you can see a lot of them are kind of early 90s, running through to kind of late 90s, or potentially early, um, early in the kind of 2000s as well. Um, again, more of the kind of smaller clubs, a lot of these are sec second division. A few kind of name highlights. Uh, we've got the Band of the Indians, which is quite an interesting one. Um, Kukulta is quite a, an indigenous area in lots of ways. Uh, you have the, the Fortress of the Southern Leopard, the Bukanamanga one, another great name. Um, what else have we got that's quite fun? Massive Attack, 
you know. That's uh, the, the, the pasto. Yeah, there we are, the pasto group. Yeah, massive attack. Big fans of the kind of music scene of the uh, that time. Uh, we've also got the the chess stain. Effectively, a mancha is like the name of a, a mass ex, a mass expanse of football fans in Colombia. Uh, it's a little bit like Boa Vista. They're one of the few clubs that have got um, a checkered shirt, Boya Cachico, um, and so on and so forth. The, the massive artillery is another great one from the otherwise uh, pretty disappointing Deportes Quindío. Um, but anyway, this is the kind of idea. And again, I showed you a few, you've seen a couple of the pictures. A lot of them have got quite kind of aggressive, quite militaristic, quite heavy metal type um, insignia badges. A lot of the writing you get is quite heavy metal based. And again, this is the kind of time where a lot of heavy metal was very popular in Colombia. There was that kind of, there was this particular interest in that kind of music because that was kind of the, the violent type aggressive music that corresponded to a lot of the urban environments of Colombia at the time. So you kind of get this cultural musical idea that crosses over into football fandom as well. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's when they're all founded. A few of them are kind of, the, the likes of these ones are not particularly big clubs uh, and they're not particularly established fan groups. So, you know, the, the website I went to to try and find out didn't actually know. So, um, okay, we probably need to deal with the fan violence first. So I think that's uh, important. It's something that we all know about. Um, Really, you have to look at football violence in Colombia as part of a wider problem, okay? Uh, in 1948, if you cast your minds back, um, there was a guy called uh, Gaetan who was assassinated. He was a liberal politician. This kind of set off a civil war in Colombia between conservatives and liberals. The El Dorado period was kind of formed on the back of this as a kind of distraction device. This is seen as kind of like an original violent sin, okay? This is where a lot of the violence in Colombia starts. You have, you know, war going in the countryside. Um, it kind of morphs eventually into guerrilla wars in the 1960s when the FARC are founded, the EPL, the ELN. And then this kind of goes further forward into you have the drug cartel period from the late 70s all the way through the 90s. You have a paramilitary organization which is based on right-wing groups who were fighting against the FARC because the FARC were trying to take over the lands. So what you have, and, and the state as well, so you have this kind of multifaceted violence going in the country with left Careers of the left and three or four different types, paramilitaries, the state, drug cartels. And what this leads to is violence becoming very embedded. You have pretty much everyone in Colombia either being affected directly or indirectly by the violence. You see it on TV, it's you know, massacres are talked about every day in the papers, there are bombs, there are the planes are getting blown up and stuff like that, there are assassinations. And you also have mass displacement. In a population of something like 52 million at the moment, it's something along the lines of six million people have been displaced in Colombia. So that gives you an idea of the extent of what the violence is. A lot of the people that, that um, have been displaced will turn up in Bogotá, in Medellín, in Cali, these kind of cities. And they kind of bring an experience of violence with them. And they're looking for protection, they're trying to get established. Um, and then you have this kind of uh, recruitment of gang members, uh, particularly in the kind of cartel years. But then the FARC and paramilitary start moving into the cities as well to kind of recruit people. And so there is a lot of urban violence going on. The worst of it is in Medellin in the early 90s. Um, but it kind of continues. And again, things have got better in the last kind of eight years or so with the peace deal and so on and so forth and with urban projects in Medellin. But it is a phenomenon that is very, very present in Colombian society. So that idea that violence is common, it's banal, it's, it's embedded, it's normal means that it's something that a lot of the kids in Colombia know, they see, they experience, they know about it. Uh, they're trying to protect themselves because the law enforcement isn't doing it. And of course, it goes from the, the barrios, the kind, of, the kind of social areas, and it, it, it emerges in the stadiums. So it's not really necessarily something that is originally a problem of, we hate the, the guys from Independiente Medellin and we're Nacional. It doesn't necessarily start there, it kind of becomes that as these rivalries get embedded, and as violence becomes a way of expressing that type of violence as well. Um, the other things that are, it's kind of linked to is that Colombia is a, a very geographically um, diverse place, there's a lot of mountains, uh, a lot of the country is quite hard to get to from another part of it. So you have this very strong embedded regionalism. And so places like Bogota have a very strong sense of we are from Bogota, so in Medellin, in Cali, and the other places, they're very tied to being very proud of this particular area. 
and they have been also part of the, the kind of Colombian conflict. So the kind of sense of regional rivalries does embed itself into football rivalries as well at a later date, you know, much kind of in, into the 1990s. That's where it really becomes expressed. Um, the first football violences really emerged in about 1993 in Bogota uh, between the Blue Rain Barra of, of, um, of Millonarios, uh, one of the famous Colombian clubs that I'm sure you would have talked about, uh, and Santa Fe, uh, but also then with Millonarios and Atletico Nacional, which is a Medellin team. Um, that's where it really starts. Um, another phenomenon that's really important to realise, it's not just between rival Barras, it's not just city to city or, or inter-city Barras, it's violence within the Barras itself. You get these kind of social disputes, which, is, which are often kind of territorial disputes in the country, in the city, and then they get taken into the stadium and then there becomes a fight due to some kind of perceived uh, inter, inter barra or intra barra kind of problem. So it's, it's not just a one club versus another club supporters, it's actually within the Barras themselves. Um, and again, a figure just to give you an idea, from 2004 to 2018, there are at least 154 murders that are probably linked to Barra membership in some kind of way. Um, that is, uh, in, if you look at Argentina in the same period, which also has a very violent Barra culture, that's three times worse, unfortunately. Things have improved but it still is a problem. A lot of the violence doesn't occur within the stadium itself, sometimes it does. I don't know if you guys can see this, but this is, these are junior supporters, this is a Barranquilla team. He's got a machete. Um, the, probably the stadium checks didn't work very well that day. It's probably, have you seen that Twitter thing where there's a bloke who just comes up and goes, and then gets, it's probably that guy. Um, but he's attacking another junior fan. One of the videos, one of the news reports from, I think it's. Last year, there was a Deportivo Cali versus America derby. The police stopped a van of Deportivo Cali fans and they found 40 machetes uh, in the van. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure the Carlisle fans would have been bringing those uh, today. But. but that's the kind of extent of the problem. And you do see this, the kind of knife culture is, is a problem. A lot of the, the issues are stabbing related, unfortunately. Um, other barrel problems. Um, again, this is a social issue. You have to see this as a social problem, a lot of the problems that are associated with the badass. Um, there is a huge amount, as you can imagine, of media stigmatization. Any time there is some kind of violence at all, immediately, bada bravas, there's a social problem, this is part of the, the Colombian problem. Why are the police not, not getting rid of these delinquentes, these delinquents, they're all drug addicts, they're all alcoholics, they're, you know, they're, why, why are we not dealing with our youth? And a lot of the right-wing politics in Colombia will immediately jump on this bandwagon and say, we need to sort this, this social problem out. They're all involved in gangs. They're probably all in the FARC. You know, this kind of narrative will always go on. Um, there has been, and there is always, alleged links with criminal gangs. It's one of the main problems of a lot of the, the badass and why a lot of the Badismo Social projects were set up, to try and stop the young guys we talk about from 15 to 20 maybe, joining a criminal gang or these urban cartels or these kind of criminal gangs there. Uh, and there have been, there's been a lot of kind of association between the two. And there are links and everyone, again, the politicians particularly love to say, we need to clear these out, they're all organized. Um, the other problem that all the badass have is that they're not, they don't get the rights that other people do. Because one of the main unusual things about Colombia is that for a long time you really weren't allowed to be a, a fan visiting a different city. There was a lot, a lot of the uh, cities would stop, would kind of close the gates to opposing fans. So if you wanted to go from, you know, you're an America fan traveling from Cali to watch Atletico Nacional play, you couldn't go. The, the, the gates were closed. So a lot of the badass were saying, why is it that we're, that we're citizens of this country and we're not allowed to travel through this country to go and watch football? And that was a real problem and, and continues to be a big problem of the kind of right, the lack of rights that Bada members often have. On an individual level, uh, the studies that have carried out see there's a lot of drug abuse, um, petty delinquency involved in uh, sicario type crimes, the kind of street assassinations that you go on. Um, a lot of them are from what's called the knee knee generation. They're neither educated nor they've got work. Um, so they're coming from that kind of background. A lot of them are from some of the the slum barrios that people who have been displaced from other areas of Colombia have gone to, uh, which are very precarious, the law enforcement isn't really there. 
you have a lot of broken homes, people whose fathers have died in the conflict or mothers have been raped in the conflict, you know, don't have these family structures. So they're, they're quite an unstable, it's quite an unstable background. Um, and there's, you know, the kind of the machismo, the kind of the male, strong, violent kind of characteristics of Colombia, unfortunately, is a very present thing. So there's a lot of this toxic masculinity that, that kind of very quickly uh, breaks out and explodes into potential violence or conflict. And again, these are the problems that the ballots themselves are trying to sort out because the government really hasn't been. Okay, and we'll come to that as we go along. Um, so, what are these badass? How do we recognize them? What are they there for? One of the main bits about it is there is incredible loyalty. There is an incredible tie and identity construct. It becomes a family. It becomes a, a place where they go. It becomes kind of almost their whole community and their life. It doesn't, it doesn't start and stop when the game's on. It is a week-long commitment for a lot of the kids that are involved who aren't in these jobs or schools or whatever. Um, and again, it becomes something they can identify with and be proud of and be associated with. That takes them away from the other identifications that we've talked about in the last slide. Um, they're often, which is they come from these lower kind of estratos, the lower kind of social classes. Um, you often have this them and us. Again, that's quite a natural football thing, but it's particularly embedded in Colombia because you have such a strong kind of within the city. Different barrios belong to different groups or different gangs. So these kind of very, very localized identities get embedded as well. Um, and again, one of the other most important things about it is it's incredibly ritualized. There is an incredible amount of, of uh, conventions and practice and day-to-day -day routines and match routines and what you do and how you do it and what you do in the, in the grounds. That becomes very important as a kind of uh, a sense of community and a sense of identity. So this ritualistic aspect is hugely important. Um, What's also really key is that they're part of, they're increasingly people who are driving potentially improvement in some of the communities where they are. They're not just football fans now, they've become genuine social actors who are collaborating with municipal authorities in certain programs to kind of clean up certain areas. So this is another phenomenon that's happening quite a lot across Colombia. Um, they're always in the same place, they're always in the same stand. Every part of the barra, because again we'll talk about that, there's lots of different parts of it, will be in their determined place, and they all are going to have a thing called aguante, okay, which is the key characteristic of the barras. So we need to talk about aguante. So aguante is resistance, it's commitment, it's loyalty, it's steadfastness, it's sticking with the team through the freaking thing. And this is the biggest concept in South American fandom, okay, through. Uh, Argentina through Colombia is Aguante. There's a film about it. Uh, this one says it's, it means the, your life for a flag. Um, one of the things that the other fan groups used to do and still do is try to steal each other's flags as a kind of mark of bravery, I suppose. Um, but it's not just linked to violence, and that's really important. It is linked to passion. It's linked to the festivity. It's, it's linked to creating the carnival, because the biggest thing about any South American football that's the best thing is that this is where the carnival is, this is where the party is, this is where the show is, and the show will start 15 minutes before the game starts, probably more, and it will go on entirely through the first half, it will go through the break, the, the half, the half time bit as well, it will go on during the second half, and it will go on until we're let out of the ground. You know, in one case, I, was, I went to watch a Santa Fe versus Cali game, uh, the America fans were still there an hour and a half after the game had finished and were still singing. Okay, that's like one thing. So it's, it's, it's the carnival aspect, it's providing the spectacle, but it is also linked to we fight if we have to. And if the team are playing and we are the 12th man and we don't, stop, we don't stop supporting, but equally, if we're being attacked, then we will attack back. And that is expected. So it's kind of a code of honor, it's a loyalty, it's linked to masculine pride, it's linked to resistance, uh, and it has to be constantly demonstrated. Okay, from game to game, from match to match, from journey to journey, away games, you go, you sing, you bring your musical instruments, you bring your flares, you paint your face, you get your tattoo done, and you have to keep the aguante every single game. And part of the problem is this, is that this links into the kind of toxic masculinity aspect, is that one of the ways in which you get respect, and you get respect from the barra in terms of your identity as a barra member, is through fighting, is through having battle scars, it's through having maybe been arrested, it's through having stolen someone else's flag, which leads to probably a fight. 
it's, and that's what is linked to, or used to be linked to very strongly, to admiration, respect, and again, this is what a lot of these kids want, coming from the homes in which they do. So Guante is an amazing concept because it, it generates the passion and the party and the fun that we all love about watching South American football on TV. But also, it's the bit that you know, guarantees where the problems are, and you can't unpack the two. That's where the problem really lies. Uh, and that's why it's so hard to get rid of this violence, because it's tied into male loyalties, and it's tied into respect, and it's tied into the social problems, and all that kind of thing. Um, again, this is another picture of the, the, the Santa Fe Barra. This is your fan group, and it's the one that has Aguante. You know, we're the ones that have Aguante. Okay? Um, and that was just to kind of show they were putting on. So Aguante, you will see it everywhere. Um, it's the main aspect of these Barras. Okay, the organisation. I'm going to show you a couple of slides showing you how organised it really is. Because it's not just a group of guys that get together and they always sit in the same place. Okay? Um, generally, there will be a kind of central committee in lots of different ways. And then there will be a kind of breakdown of subcommittees that will all have a particular role. Some of them will be in charge of the carnival, the, the party. Some of them will be in charge of the music. Some of them will be in charge of the travel. There will be people who are in charge of the, 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 kind of the major demonstrations of fandom. Um, they will be involved with merchandise, they will be involved with social projects, they will be involved with the travel arrangements, so on and so forth. So they will be committed for all these things. And again, a lot of them are either organised through those kind of functions or through the parts of the city where they live. Okay, and we'll show you how that works in a, in a little bit. Um, for example, in Cali, uh, the Deportivo uh, Barra, the Frente Radical Verde Blanco, the Radical Green and White Front. Uh, not, it's kind of like a little bit of a Monty Python type name, really, not one of the better ones. Um, but they've got a good picture, I'll show you a picture of them in a minute. Um, they call their, their, their kind of area subcommittees legions. Okay, they have legions in each part of the city. Um, and again, you have various levels of democracy. There are meetings that will involve the central kind of commandos, the central command, and will involve the leaders of the different kind of subcommittees or the leaders of the local groups. So it's quite, it's quite structured, it's quite hierarchical. Uh, most of them will now have a clubhouse. This is, the, this is a Medellin, uh, sorry, this is a Millonarios one. You can see that this is where they're building um, one of the trapples, one of the massive um, uh, kind of flags that goes up in the stands. This is where it kind of happens. You can see all these people. This is why it's a week to, you know, weekly job. All these people are putting together this, this incredible flag that will cover you know, probably half the, the stand where they, where they go. Okay, so that's kind of how it works. Um, you probably can't see this very well, it's a little bit dark, but this is the America de Cali Baron Rojo Sur. This is the Cali based one. So they have a, a well, I'll look at it here. They have the, the Scarlet Assembly, which is the very top register. Then you have the directors of the various blocks. Uh, you have the leaders of the groups of work, the projects that they're doing, kind of the second level. Then you have the actual block members who are in charge of certain projects. You have the leaders of affiliated associations, that might be other groups in different cities, for example. Then you have various, uh, then you have just the general members of the Bada. To working groups, so again we have here, for example, sorry I can't see it very well, we have the, or the orchestra, okay, that's one of the, group, the people who just do the music. We have the, 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 the banners, that's another group. We have the, um, we have the communication team, we have the, the Peace Foundation. Uh, we have the travel group, we have the people in charge of Aguante, there's a group for the Aguante, um, and we have the uh, human rights group. Okay, so that's, the, that's how the blocks function, that's what they're, how it's composed and what work they're doing. Similarly, you then have the, the uh, other blocks which are the geographical areas. So these are the kind of ways in which they organise geographically in the city of Cali. And again, we've got some great names, we have the Plague, we have the Sons of Cain, we have uh, the, what else we've got? We've got the, uh, the Possessed by the Devil group, very well known for their kind of charity work. Um, we, have, we have the Fifth of the Infernal, um, but most of them are kind of areas of the city. That's where they're established and they meet and they travel to the ground together. That's how they organise. Deportivo Cali, same city, uh, have a similar thing, but they just have a central kind of committee area, the Cupola Central. And all of these are the kind of localised legions, okay, they're called legions, the local groups in the different parts of the city. And again, a few kind of highlights names, we've got um, the extreme hard south, we all know the south's the hard bit. 
Um, everyone, it's very southern oriented, the fan group, for some reason. We have the Wild Green, which obviously has certain connotations. Uh, we have the Northern Squadron, um, and so on and so forth. What the problem is here is that, as we said, a lot of these are geographically organised within Cali. The reason why it's done that way is because you get these kind of city problems, where fans of America who are in a certain part of the city, and fans of Deportivo Cali who are in another part of the city, when they're travelling to a game, home or away, you will cross the city, and it was quite common for the Bala members of a particular block to be located in a certain part of the town where they knew the other team's badass were going to be, and the blocks were going to be. So you get these in-city conflicts as they're travelling to different games. So you have this kind of localised blocks and gangs that are there for protection when they're going to the games, but also in charge of the music. So the legions in Cali, all of these groups will have their own determined spot on the stand. They will all have their name as a banner. They will all have their own band. They will all have their own you know, kind of plans for what they're going to do. But their plans will have to be approved by the Cupola Central, okay? Who will say, yes, you can, we all do this. But equally, to get at Guante, to get kind of respect, there is a competition going on who does it best. So this is why you get these intra barra problems as well with saying, we want to do this, we're doing this, why can't we? You guys have did this to us last week, there's a problem. So you get these intra barra plans, and every now and again you get a schism where a different batter will set up, and then they'll have to find somewhere else in the stand to be. So that's how it kind of works. Um, the stadium, I think this is the bit you've probably seen really, but we have orchestras, there are songs, and it is a 140, 50 minute phenomenon. Uh, constant jumping, whoever isn't jumping is probably, unfortunately, gay, very commonly, or a member of you know, a different team, or might even be English. If it's particularly bad, that's often a, very much in Argentina, that's one. El que no saltas ingles. Whoever isn't jumping is English. Okay, the Scottish obviously do jump, and probably the Welsh as well. Um, you have these kind of trapos, you have these mass demonstrations of you know, these huge pictures, you have the mosaics, you have tifos, are the really huge ones. The tifo is the incredible display. I'll show you a couple of examples of that. Um, what you can see here, this is pastel. Okay? Um, you have the different flags are the different legions of the blocks of pastel. So this is what you'll see, that that's where one main group is, but then this will be a different, a different part of the banner. Flares, fireworks, colour, display, carnival, incredibly organised, and if you get the chance, try and nick someone else's stuff, okay? which is a massive problem. Unfortunately, these were going to be the videos. Uh, they haven't really worked, but what you can see at least is this is a mosaic, and this is a this is a Bogota, this is the Millonarios one in the Nemesio Camacho. The whole of one side of the stand is all saying Millonarios, and it carries on all the way around to about here, behind the other goal, just of mosaics. Okay, organized by the uh, the, the blue rain in this particular instance. That's an example of a kind of mosaic. Deportivo Cali, them of the um, not particularly organized um, or great fan name. This is a, it was, unfortunately it doesn't work, but the video here is them raising this Hulk sign. And it's not a massive game, uh, it's a midweek game, but you see them kind of, all these people just working in the stand to raise this TIFO, this would be a TIFO, uh, of Deportivo Cali as the Green Hulk. And what's quite funny is it collapses <laughs> one bit, there's a general sense of dismay and disappointment, but then everyone is working really hard to get it back up again. So, again, I'll try and link these on my Twitter site or something similar. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, let's just see if it works. No. No, anyway. <laughs> anyway I'll, I'll link it on uh, somewhere else. Yeah, just, yeah, if you be the Hulk, I'll be the guy who just There we go. <laughs> anyway, so that's uh, Deportivo Cali doing it properly, or not quite. Um, the next one, um, I love this one. This is Junior. Um, but Bucana, they're taking the piss out of Bucaramanga. Bucaramanga were, were about to get relegated, were in danger of being relegated. And in Colombia, the second division is called the B. And so anyone who is about to get relegated, they talk about the fantasma de la vie, the ghost, the fear of going down. So what they did uh, was they, again, you, they, it's kind of hidden, and then just before the game starts, they, they rose this kind of ghost. And there's a blood, there are various ghosts you know, running around at the front of the stand as well. When I was in the America the Cali Santa Fe game, uh, 
amazing display. Um, America had just been promoted, um, but there's a weird system that there's a kind of like an average of point system. So America was still in danger of going down, even the fact they were about ninth in the league. And what happened, the Guardia Albirojo Sur, um, what they did was they had the flag, they had a massive flag that covered the whole of the stand, and it was just Santa Fe. And then, um, and then it kind of, you could see rustling behind it. You know, you could see there was something going on. And then the flag just kind of was pulled all the way down to the front. And underneath, everyone was effectively organized into a Ghostbusters. Kind of, you know, the Ghostbusters logo, the kind of the fear of the ghost, and we're, you know, we're gonna defeat, you know, the guys that are the ghosts. So that was the, that was a joke. Um, it was amazingly coordinated. But that's the kind of display that they do. Um, this one, unfortunately, um, this was a kind of a, a, a kind of panorama of the Deportivo Independiente de Medellín, Resistencia Norte. And again, it gives you an idea of the songs, the music, the different badass, the, the explosion of colour that goes on. A lot of you will have kind of seen this kind of thing anyway, of what South American football was like. But the idea was to show you where the different parts of the barra, where the different parts of the barra are, and the kind of music and song, and the different orchestras that are going on. I'm sure this is still working. In city, you will see a clear demarcation of zones that are controlled by the different barras. Okay, and they talk about uh, different types of graffiti. There's a, an article by a mate of mine called Kevin Russell, who talks about the fact that there's dominant graffiti, which is like this: the established. This is our zone of the city. You know, it's it's totally ours. There's no control. There's no competing barras. Santa Fe aren't there, and this is our zone. And we put up our our very kind of artistic, long-lasting graffiti that will stay there. Then you get these kind of running graffitis, which are kind of like, you know, the we don't have much time and we've just put a bit of ink. Um, things like kind of this uh, or this. And then you get what's called um, the kind of dominated graffiti, which is graffiti that was of a different club, but then someone, some battle member has gone and actually painted something of a different club over it, probably in a, an area of the town that wasn't theirs. So again, this is another cause of potential conflict within the cities as someone might see who the hell has painted this Santa Fe sign, you know, on you know, something that was Mionaris, for example. Uh, and then you get what's called, I guess, transgressive graffiti, similar kind of thing. You've got here the, um, the Commando Sazules kind of wall, and someone from Santa Fe has come and sprayed a, a thing about it there. So it's, it's actually kind of part of the, the Barra identity problem in the city kind of violences in the way that graffiti is used to kind of control and demarcate where we are and where we're not. And this is part of why you have these blockers that are in charge of these kind of things as well. Um, tattoos is a huge thing, massive thing. Uh, there are some incredible bits. This is one of the, the Fortress Leopard from Bucaramanga, those who are in danger of going down. Uh, we have the, the, the Banda del Indio. Um, these are some of the Deportivo Pereira who won the league last year. Uh, even a club that's very small like Alianza Petrolera. The tattoo art is a big deal, and it's part of the aguante, and it's also um, the things that can't be stolen. That's kind of why they do it. It is always us, it is ingrained in us. Um, it is a de demonstration of what we are, we, and that identity is embedded within us. So it's a really important part of this, you know, masculinity, this aguante, this kind of resistance kind of idea. Um, right, moving on to the kind of barismo social, this is an important bit, which I think is a big deal that we don't see enough of this. And Colombia is probably the, the, the South American leader in trying to change societies through badass, okay? We've talked about these very precarious situations in which Colombian cities are found in. What started to happen in the early 2000s was there were projects that were carried out to try and bring Barra members together, to try and avoid them from joining gangs, from trying to avoid them becoming involved in drugs or sicarios or social other social problems. And it became kind of a part of social work, but it wasn't carried out by social workers, it was carried out by the clubs themselves. And the older members of the club who saw it as being a problem and were trying to create a more uh, safer, a more secure environment. And it's kind of morphed since then uh, in that it becomes an educational project, they run workshops, they run training things, people who've got a certain type of expertise will train younger kids in in electrics or plumbing or something. It also tries to get them ways of um, learning about their political rights. A lot of these kids don't know what their rights are. Um, 
and it was a way in which they could educate them into what politics was, what kind of problems there were, how they, you know, what their rights were, and how they could learn to defend themselves on, on a kind of legal level and, and fight for you know, greater democracy, greater you know, rights in the Colombian state. Um, and what, it, what this, these barriers have become, it's not a total phenomenon, not everyone in the barriers involved with it, these are sections. But it, is, it, was, it was a very kind of transformative social environment for the people in the club, who were, in the barrier who were joining it, but then going back into the communities, because they saw the communities as being the source of violence. So they were trying to educate these kids and saying, you know, this is how we, we stop conflicts, this is how we resolve conflict, this is kind of football for peace methodologies. Uh, this is how this is how you can earn money here. Let's try and create some kind of merchandising project or money-making project that will help you um, And it's a really big deal. Uh, it's a really important thing and it's a very Colombian phenomenon uh, In South America, they're trying to sort out the problems that were in their particular communities What's really interesting about it is that they then get a particular voice and it intercedes into political decision-making about How to solve the problem of Colombian football and violence in particular? Um, here's one of the projects they're involved with. This is a, a, a kind of a, a kind of a, a work project. It's called Badass Building the Country, and pretty much every Bada in the country was was talked to by the government in a lawmaking process. Say, right, how do we solve the problem of violence? Um, but it, more importantly, the Badas organised so across the country. It wasn't just you know certain Badas. It was there was a kind of like a kind of a almost a community of leaders of different badass who are saying we need to work together so that this legislation does the right thing for us. And previously you can imagine governments tend to just go for a violent option. How do we provide security? How do we punish those responsible? How do we, you know, legislate? What they did, the badass did, was they managed to get the idea of improved fan conditions within the stadium, what they were allowed to do, what they could bring in, but also about coexistence and how the state was supposed to be enforcing their, you know, providing the rights that these kids, you know, deserved. So coexistence and, um, uh, and comfort and a fan experience became really important. And it, it was supposed to be the state in law has to provide and help support workshops, education projects, they have to respect Paris Mont Social. It is part of the law of the land in various laws that the state should be supporting them and it's recognised as a kind of community project within all the different cities where these different clubs are. So it's a really big deal. This one is also the kind of public policy that it's very much part of. And what you get is that something that was started literally just to punish has actually become a very positive methodology that, that promotes football for peace. And it's not just within the, the professional football environment, it also was the methodologies then became used when Colombia's peace process happened um, and football was taken to the FARC demobilization camps and used as a methodology to say, right, we need to stop these community violence and how do we reintegrate these, these former guerrillas into our society? So it's this amazing situation where what happened with Badass has then become a really important methodology in the whole country to try and bring football to peace and try and reduce the violence as part of Colombian um, society more generally. Again, here are some of the kind of features of it. This is one of the uh, kind of um, intercity projects. There are lots of different fan members going on there. There was a kind of football tournament uh, in one of the most marginalised uh, parts of, of Medellin. Okay. Um, here's another thing. A little, the Cali, the Cali mayor uh, invested three thousand million pesos. That isn't as much as it sounds. Colombian money um, in social barismo. So this, there, is, there is a kind of an institutional investment in this, trying to you know, um, provide um, great support. Huge amount of things that go on, Christmas gifts, community support, community cleanups, education programs. I did a talk for the Los del Sur, the Medellin Barra of Nacional, talking about leadership, talking about the type of leadership projects and support for peace projects. So that's kind of how they reach out. You know, some of these, some of these Barras are reaching out to, to people here to talk to them about about that, and I did another one about the kind of ways in which uh, football violence was was being solved in, in Britain as well. Okay, so so this is the kind of things that they do. There's a real commitment to try and solve their problems of their members within their communities because they don't see the the, um, the the government or the state as being able to do that. Um, there's a huge focus on human rights, on citizenship, on political education, and so on and so forth. And it become, it's not just every club will have its own one, but there are increasingly ways of meeting the other barriers to stop the potential violence that often is kicked up 
to try to stop that happening. They're kind of part of that project. Um, just finally, um, just a couple of examples of what's going on. This is in the Interior Ministry in Colombia. Uh, we have the Colombian Ballast for Coexistence. And you can, I mean, you can't see it very well here, but this is all the representatives, all, a lot of the different badass were there meeting with the sports minister, the interior minister, to try and sort out this law. And again, this present this united front that's very, very unusual in anywhere in South America. Uh, and again, another kind of example, this was a guy called Juan Manuel Bonrunet Nieto, who was murdered by paramilitaries on his way back from an Atletico Nacional versus America game, who was an America fan. Uh, he and a friend of his were murdered. This was an association that was created with the aim of reducing these, this club violence by the guy's dad, who's an amazing guy. Uh, I met him and interviewed him for my book. Um, and again, just an example of these kind of club initiatives to try and stop the violence that's permeated Colombia and the communities in which the fans come from and Colombian football more widely. So just an example of what's going on from a football level to try and stop the problems that probably all of you guys know is the first thing you think about when you think of Colombia. Because that's how football is dealing with this. Uh, anyway, I've probably prattled along far too long. Uh, that's me. Um, if anyone's interested, um, this is a book that I wrote. It came out last year. It's actually free. Uh, you can download it from the address there. Um, it's about Colombia's peace process and how football was part of that in, from 2010 through to 2018, more or less. Uh, and again, if you're interested, I've done loads of podcasts about South American history and stuff like that. So... You can have a look at those on Linktree. But yeah, any questions about this or about Colombian football history, anything, go for it. Thank you. Any questions? Go on, man. We'll get money first. Go on, man. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank you for um, such a really good flavour, giving a good flavour of. Um, I'm a, a Chilean Rafa City fan. Um, uh, I'm also going to be heavy metal. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but I just wanted to um, sort of say that there's some, some amazing similarities with the uh, European culture of, the, you know, hooliganism, the ultras. Um, you, you, made, you made some good points about the uh, de demonstrations of loyalty. Is that there's a uh, in Stuttgart, I went to the first game of the season there a few years ago. There was a massive demonstration. They love the flares over there, uh, but we don't have the same sort of culture over here. Um, there's a lot of reparational sort of stuff happening, like we said, over here and uh, in Europe. I think, um, but just making a point about the, the left and the right, I think there isn't so much of the left, so, so to speak, in, in Britain, well, in England, there is maybe perhaps in Germany or certainly Italy as well. Um, and in Scotland, you've got like the Celtic sort of ultras that have sort of got Palestinian flags and stuff. That's quite an interesting sort of take on things. And um, yeah, uh, the other thing was uh, the Football League. Um, the Football Sports Association are working on partnership to try and um, alleviate some of the um, things because you think you're right, a lot of things are, come from social problems, but then again, at the same time, you've got some well, well off professionals. As you go higher up the, the chain, you know, like you look at Man United and Aston Villa's and for, you know, you might have professional sort of buildings and people and good jobs and stuff. Anyway, I'll leave it there. I presume if I look you up on the internet, then I'll find all the things that you've been doing. But it's just interesting about the fact that there are, you're talking about the different schisms within a badass for a particular club, because I don't know if you do see that in over here to a certain extent, because I'm, I'm assuming, say, a city like, um, Bo you know, Bogota, where you've got a few big teams there, that the people who support perhaps uh, millionaires, millionaires come from, do they come from a, a, a kind of area of, of Bogota in the same way that, like, 
Arsenal fans <laughs> tend to be from North London and then just a few miles away you've got Spurs fans that come with them. I mean, is it the same that it is quite geographical way uh, no, the team not. that you support? Yeah, it it's not really, not no. Colombia. It's it's one of those weird things that, you know, you get like Argentina, Uruguay, um, sorry, um, sorry, um, yeah, um, it's something with, there's a podcast series I've done called These, These Football Times and if you're interested in South American football widely, the first series is all about all the South American countries and the history of those. The most recent ones we've done, I think there's eight or nine that have been released now, are about the cities. And that's one of the things we talk about, about where the identities come from in terms of which area. Argentina has got lots of clubs that are based around a particular part of the city, you know, whether it's Racing or Independiente from Avellaneda or the Boca area, which is very specified. Um, you know, somewhere like Atlanta, one of the smaller clubs, is very much the club of the Jewish uh, community, the Jewish diaspora left to go to Argentina, you know, back in the early, the kind of late 1900s, early, sorry, the late 1800s and early 1900s. So you have that, there's a very strong barrio, of, you know, the neighbourhood identity in a lot of these cities. That's not really the case of Colombia, because the way the clubs were founded was really by kind of members of the elite in different schools, and then they kind of came and they folded, um, but they weren't really established on a localised idea. And part of the displacement of Colombia as well contributes to that, is that a lot of the Colombian societies of these kind of people are quite mobile. You know, they've come from different parts of the countryside from all over the country, and then they've, they've come to these industrial areas, and they just live where they can. So they're not really, having said, right, Barrio Kennedy is Santa Fe. Whoever's from that area, that's, that's part of it. The problem you have in something like Bogota and in Cali and in Medellin is that the clubs, actually not Cali anymore, because Deportivo and Cali have their own stadium, but the, the Nemesio Camacho in Bogota is shared by both Santa Fe and Millonarios. So you don't have it being tied to this part of the city. It's the stadium for everyone in the city, and that's why you get people from similar barrios coming to the same area just to go to watch their clubs. It's not tied to a neighbourhood as such. What I guess you do have, like I was talking about a little bit, is that the block is, the various blocks or the legions that are based around geographical areas mean that there be then becomes a tradition of supporting a particular club if you live on that particular part of town or that particular barrio or that particular street or that particular neighbourhood. But it might, be quite, it might be quite unstable, it might be quite conflicted depending on what's going on and how many people are there and how concentrated or organised a particular block or legion might be. So it isn't, you don't have that same origin point of, you know, if you come from that part of Bogota, you are of that club. It's just not there because of all those different features. Anybody else? Okay, we'll call it wrap it up, I guess. You can go drinking and go for curries now, can't you? <laughs> um, our next talk, oh, by the way, thanks to Pete. That was absolutely fantastic. I think we've... <laughs> Our next talk is on the 18th of February. It's uh, Chris Gaffney going to talk about digging up the Valley Parade pitch. He probably should have been down there this week. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of friction. <laughs> yeah, but, but remember Chris did the, we, we did the art and archaeology thing at Bradford Park Avenue back in 2015. He's gone on to Booth and Crescent at York. And of course now it's the University of Bradford Stadium at Valley Parade. So we expect a little bit about Valley Parade. But anyway, hope to see you all then. We hope to have a football game in between then and then. But thanks for your Thank you. Thank you.